The following stories in this video are all personal and do not reflect the views of Leeds Autism AIM or Advanet. LGBTQ plus and neurodivergence, our stories. This is a video by Leeds Autism AIM. They are part of the Advanet group. This video is part of the Partners in Pride virtual Pride event, led by Touchstone, Leeds Mind, Community Links and Inspire North. Neurodiversity is a word used to describe how everyone's brain is different. People who are neurodivergent have brains that are different from the norm. Examples of neurodivergent conditions are autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, ADHD, and Tourette's syndrome. The idea of neurodiversity is for everyone. It was coined by autistic activist Judy Singer in the late 1990s. It is a word often used today by groups led by and run for people who are autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or neurodivergent in any other way. Neurodiversity is seen as something to be celebrated. Here is a quote explaining neurodiversity from Jill Looms Quinn. She is an LGBTQ plus autistic academic and researcher. Jill is also Leeds Autism AIM's peer development worker. The politics of neurodiversity is not about arguing for the value of neurodivergence within the physical and social boundaries of the status quo. It is the work of presenting a radical challenge to these boundaries. Not begging for room at the table, but a full-on elbows-out battle to shift the furniture and make room. A bold, human assertion of a claim for space. Intersectionality is where someone has more than one identity. There are many neurodivergent people who are also LGBTQ+. Some neurodivergent LGBTQ plus people also have other identities, for example, being black. There are many people who are both LGBTQ and neurodivergent in Leeds. As an example of this, out of a team of eight people, five Leeds Autism AIM staff members fit that description. Many autistic people who access our services are also LGBTQ+. Neurodivergent LGBTQ plus people are more likely to face barriers to accessing services and to joining in with community groups, activities and events. Some of us are also more likely to experience mental health difficulties because of those barriers. In this video, we aim to share our stories. Cheryl, what pride means to them. Pride isn't just rainbows and glitter. It isn't just dancing around and having fun. The first pride was a protest. And to this day, it still is. Until we have equality in this world and people are accepted for who they are, for who they love, for being themselves. It's always going to be a protest. Love who you want to love unconditionally without being scared is the biggest thing for me. That's what pride means to me. We need more love, less hate. Lily, how LGBTQ plus and OCD intersect. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm queer and I have OCD and I wanted to talk a little bit about the intersections of that and why the mental health care system really needs to up its game when it comes to making things accessible to queer and queer and neurodivergent people. So, um, basically, uh, <laughs> I'm only out to uh, 
my most current therapist. Um, OCD requires a lot of kind of um, supervised um, therapy. I'm under CPT, which needs like supervision from a professional um, in order to be successful. But up until this year, I hadn't felt comfortable at all um, even mentioning my queerness. I feel like lots of neurodivergent people are possibly operating health systems without um, admitting their queerness um, because it feels safer and it feels easier. Um, the fact is that with OCD, on all the literature that they give you, they characterise intrusive thoughts and they give examples. Um, an intrusive thought is basically um, something that really offends your moral or um, ethical um, feelings, or it might just be something really horrible, like visions of someone you love being hurt. Um, but in all the examples, they always put um, questioning your sexuality or gender. And while that might potentially be distressing for um, cis people, uh, cis straight people, I have to say that reading that as a young queer person over and over again just made me feel really unsafe to even try to come out um, to my therapists because um, I've had a lot. Um, so and I think that it's part of the... So growing up I was just really, really... Um, the fact that queerness is kind of pathologized into something that is sexually deviant, um, that is equatable to being criminal or being ill and has been in the past, has been criminalized, has been um, seen as a mental illness. Um, and I feel like we still have a lot of these hang-ups, especially in the healthcare system. Um, so the fact that an example of intrusive thoughts that came up on every single piece of literature that I read on OCD being a feeling of questioning your sexuality was just um, made it feel really unsafe. I, I just didn't feel like even if I mentioned it, it would be validated or that someone would try and tell me that I wasn't queer because I have OCD. Um, so there's that. And I know in mental health care, it's just very difficult anyway. Um, I have friends who just, a lot, well, they haven't told um, the therapist their pronouns because they don't feel safe to. So they're constantly being misgendered in sessions, which are meant to be, you know, healing them. And that's just not okay. And I think if just a little bit of training was done on things like pronouns in mental health care, this, it would make things so much more accessible. Um, and I know that lots of therapists just might accidentally or repeatedly misgender someone and I'm really glad that I've gotten to a point where I can actually correct my therapist um, if I mention someone in my life and um, she misgenders them accidentally. As a survivor of trauma as well, um, at an early age, I just... The fact that um, heteronormative discourse classifies um, queerness as equitable to um, criminal sexual acts, like acts that are just completely immoral, um, I just, it really me up and gave me intrusive thoughts in which I was some kind of predator and that was a big part of why I got so ill and it was a big part of why I didn't tell anyone for ages and I feel like yes if I'd made if I'd met my accepting space um sooner then I would be a lot happier um so yeah, I just, I'm not sure what else to say, but um, I hope some of that made sense, I'm a bit rambly. And I just wanted to say that um, neurodivergence is 
queer in itself um, to me in that it's just like disrupting normative uh, narratives of what is normal, I guess. Um, I think queerness and neurodiversity goes really well together hand in hand and I know so many lovely um, queer and neurodiverse people. Um, so I just think I'm glad that I've managed to find the space to have that little circle of queer neurodivergent uh, space around me. I do know that the um, LGBT community and LGBT organisers do need to do a lot more in terms of accessibility. Um, the way that I've tried to manage it with my event is trialling things like allowing um, people to use STEM, giving materials that people could STEM or use as um, a way of navigating triggers if it comes up in some of the poetry or the writing that is being shared and just I feel like every queer space needs to make a direct statement that says of course we're neurodivergent friendly um because it's the we're just so brilliant and we're here obviously and I just want to wish everyone a happy pride Luke, coping at Pride Marches. My name is Luke and I'm a cisgender gay man. I am also autistic. Part of being autistic for me is avoiding large gatherings where possible. This is because they can often lead to me feeling overloaded and drained. I do make an exception for events like Leeds Pride which I have attended for most of the past five or six years. At the 2019 event, I went in a work capacity as my employer's communications lead. I coordinated their walking floats for them. For the first time ever at any Pride event, I felt I had a reason to be there. A handful of my colleagues and one of our volunteers came, which was reassuring. Being in the parade itself, I knew the overload was inevitable. After assembling just off Millennium Square where Pride kicks off and a slow trudge down towards the start of the parade route, we were made to wait for what seemed like hours before the march began. The cacophony of whoops and whistles, while all for the cause of celebrating LGBTQ plus Pride, began to have an effect. So many noises at once, coupled with Portland Gate being rammed, made it hard for me to process what was going on around me. Being unable to hear what my colleagues were saying to me made matters worse. Eventually, we set off and my overload began to ease as the parade dispersed. The simultaneous noises from marchers and audiences lining the streets were there. Fortunately, the crowding wasn't as much of an issue. Well, save for a few bottlenecks along the route. From just past the halfway point, noise levels picked up again as did uncertainty because of one change I did not account for. The route was different to last year, something I had not noticed beforehand. I went along with it, but inside, what felt like a sudden change for me contributed to a growing ill feeling. Soon, the parade end would be in sight, as would the opportunity to get myself somewhere less busy. I felt a sense of accomplishment in coming through an event that has been problematic for me in the not-too-distant past. Once the parade had ended, I sought somewhere quiet to get myself back to normal. I sat down somewhere for 10 to 15 minutes off Lower Brigade, then met with one of my colleagues for a drink. There was also the option of going to one or two designated quiet spaces that were set up prior to the event starting. After a walk through the marketplace to see what the different stalls had, I sought a quiet bar where I didn't have to speak to people. It wasn't me being antisocial, all I needed was to be somewhere without long queues where I could regain my balance. For the past few years, Leeds Pride has had at least one designated quiet space. They are venues where older and disabled people, including neurodivergent people, can go if they found the event to be too busy. In previous years, I have visited those spaces and have appreciated how useful they were. These spaces have proved to be extremely valuable to me, ensuring that there is somewhere to celebrate my sexuality without it being an afterthought when experiencing sensory overload. 
Many other neurodivergent people, who may have otherwise chosen to give Pride a miss, have found these spaces helpful. Pride is meant to be an inclusive event. Without quiet spaces or other adjustments such as wheelchair accessibility or clear signposting off the parade route, barriers are put up in front of us. Hopefully, if next year's Pride event is a physical one, we will have a few to retreat to when we need to wind down. Paisley, talking about comedy. Hi, I'm Paisley. I'm a queer non-binary autistic comedian based in Leeds. I'm also the assistant comedy producer at Bradford Fringe Festival. I'm here today in front of the classic filming at home background, The Bookcase, to talk to you about comedy and things that I've learned. Hello, I am Paisley. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. He, him, if I'm bounded by the binary. <laughs> <laughs> or we, us, if I'm holding the one ring and whispering, I'm fresh. <laughs> I first got into comedy through attending a comedy night. I've always been interested in trying it out. And I went to a comedy night years ago with a friend in Manchester. We sat right at the front. Uh, I remember it quite well. It was very confident audience members to the left of me and, uh, and and lots of regulars and it's my first time at this place I can't remember the name but I remember some of the acts I remember feeling included in the space there was um, some really cool acts I, the most notable act I saw was Harriet Dyer and I just loved her act I loved everything about it and I really kind of thought I, I want to try this I want to try comedy so I got together some writing I had a little think about it it was years later that I finally kind of got the opportunity to go on stage and try out a set for the first time uh, I went on stage and I had lots of things uh, to try out some didn't work some worked really well the audience was absolutely lovely and I learned a lot I can sometimes be socially awkward. Now, it's no different for the stage. When I'm on stage, I think I lean into that awkwardness that I create and I don't mind it. It's part of me and it's part of just what, how I talk and how I interact with people. And when I'm on stage, I don't feel any awkwardness as such. I don't feel too much worry or anxiety about what's happening i feel i'm nervous to be on stage you know don't get me wrong but being there is just very uplifting i'm learning a lot more about audiences i'm learning a lot more about um the writing process for my jokes and i'm learning each step i'm learning something different now for me my process is when i go on stage i try something new now my first year in comedy has been hugely um, experimental in what I've done and what I've learned and what I've tried out. It's been maybe a little bit scary as well. I'll go on stage and I tried out my first set. I did 10 minutes and I absolutely loved it. I got some amazing feedback from people and I really appreciate the comedians on the circuit that have helped me and I've met and I've made friends with. You're all wonderful and it's been great to then attend other places to improve and encourage and inspire and help each other. A lot of my comedy touches on what I know and things about me. At the moment, it's very personal. It's, it's either things that are about me being non-binary or it might be things about me being autistic or it might just be things that I've noticed in little details that aren't exactly about being queer, aren't exactly about being non-binary or autistic. I haven't got a set kind of thing that I've focused on within my comedy stand-up. It's mainly about what feels good at the time to talk about. I've been writing quite a lot of work and I've found that I can sometimes talk from Pokemon to Pringles, avocados to, I don't know, Lord of the Rings. So one of the big things I talk about in my comedy at the moment is about starting hormones. It's something that I've thought about for a long time, but I've really struggled to know what exactly I want. Through doing comedy and discussing this and making jokes about it, I've discovered a lot more about myself. And also just this interesting process of knowing what's right for me 
based on just being able to perform and it's been this fantastic experience uh, to be like I, look look i've got a little bit of facial hair i love it let's talk about that sort of my goals when i start tea i'm obsessed with facial hair i want facial hair i want a big moustache and this is what i want it to look like now i said i got a photo I've got a picture <laughs> I got Pringle socks. <laughs> Just to illustrate the point. Of, uh, <laughs> you know, you and that's that's kind of my goal. Uh, this big bushy moustache. Then I'm gonna go down to Morrison's. I'm gonna stand with the crisps, not just the crisps, the cheap crisps. <laughs> I'm gonna stand there. <laughs> and then they wonder why the sales of crisps are plummeted in Morrison's. <laughs> There's lots of wonderful and just accessible and um, accepting and inclusive spaces out there. In Leeds itself, we've got places like Airplay Studios, Flamingos, a writer's group called Unwritten that I'm part of, who I've also done some performances with Leeds Literature Festival, which has been absolutely fantastic. And things from like in Manchester, like Blizzard, and we've also got places like Laughable, Comedy Night. These have all been fantastic places that have encouraged and helped me and others to access and be in comedy um, and also attend comedy. I may have missed some places, so please feel free to comment more accessible, wonderful comedy spaces, performance spaces, poetry spaces that you know of. And let's kind of talk about these places. If people want to start out in comedy for the first time, these will be great for people to sort of have a look at. For people that want to attend and feel safe in a comedy environment, then these might be the places to start. I enjoy the conversations that I have after gigs and especially with people uh, who relate to the material that I'm doing and things like that. I don't have a particular aim for anything that I do in the terms of uh, set content and things like that. I just know that these little observations or these kind of little quirks about my identity and things like that come out because I want to speak about them and in turn they are super helpful for me. They're something that I kind of learn to embrace and enjoy about myself and I've become a lot more confident in me and who I am thanks to comedy and thanks to everyone that has attended, uh, has been a fantastic audience member and who I've performed with. Thank you everyone. Lizzie, my sexuality is... My sexuality. Um, my sexuality is bi, with 18 question marks. My sexuality is... My sexuality is... Magic 8 Ball says, ask again later. My sexuality is... Seven drug emojis and a wink. My sexuality is, um, uh, um, something I found in the bottom of my handbag. Right. My sexuality is, um, um, uh, um, I mean, you could argue for days about whether it's the queerness or the ADHD. Is it possible to have attention deficit as your orientation? I should research that. Sorry, um, um, 
uh, anyway, um, please don't think I'm confused or unhappy about this. You think I'd be upset I'm not sure about something? Don't like, welcome to my entire life. I don't have the brain space to angst about uncertainty. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I understand. You mean that when I talk about my sexuality, you're confused. Well, that's hardly my problem. Annabelle, Q&A on autism, relationships and more. Hi, I am Annabelle. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I am an autistic queer person. Um, I'm a lesbian and non-binary. Um, and my partner is going to ask me some random questions because I can't think what to say. So here we go. Let's see what happens because I have no idea what they're going to ask me. Hey, Annabelle, what makes you proud to be queer? Um... I don't know really. Um, I think mainly that to me being queer is, I find because it's so vague, I can explore it a lot, I guess. And I think the exploring of it's very exciting. Um, I think that's sort of what queer is to me, is just like exploring my own identity and it being very open and interpreted different to everyone. So there's no right or wrong answer, which I quite like those things, I guess. What makes you proud to be autistic? Proud to be autistic. Um, oh, my brain's gone. Well, that's autism there, isn't it? <laughs> um, proud to be autistic. Um, I mean, I, I got diagnosed um, quite late on in my life, literally only a few years ago. Um, and what made me proud for that was um, I find myself... Um, my brain's just gone. Um, I find, find that I look back at the things I say and I explore the language I use. And through doing that, I've learned quite a lot about people and language. And to me, autism has given me nearly a second spell on life and uh, another part of rediscovery again. Um, because I've been able to just like re-explore language that I thought was something, but it wasn't. Um, and it's quite nice to know that actually I'm not an angry person. <laughs> I'm just having a sensory meltdown. How did you find going through the autistic diagnostic services as an adult? Uh, terrifying. That was easy. <laughs> what is pride like? And, well, a uh, um, the autism thing as well is extremely long and it was very similar to um, the gender clinic but not as long um, so it's like very gatekeeping um, so that was quite annoying um, but it's what we have at the moment so I guess the more, more funding we get the better but I suppose uh, to get more funding we need more exposure I guess. What is pride like for you being both an autistic person with sensory issues and a very openly non-binary trans person? As in pride the month? Pride as in or... the parade that leads do um, the events. If I'm honest, I'm not a massive fan of the parade itself. Um, it can be quite, um, again, gatekeeper-y, like if you've got um, any disabilities or whatnot. Um, it's not as inclusive as it should be, and it's got a massive way to go. And also, I hate rainbow capitalism because why are they selling something that's such a massive battle for a lot of people? Like, people are dying, why are you making money for this? Doesn't make sense. Like, go away, Sainsbury's. Nice sandwiches, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, um, not just Sainsbury's. Don't just, not just they won't bring our shopping. I do, I do like Sainsbury's, so I'm just going to put that in. But, like, what has, 
you know, what has retail got to do with being gay? What has, um, what's Sky got to do with being trans? You know, like, has nothing to do with it. Like, nice, give us some money, like, fund it and stuff. But all I can say is do better. Like, money doesn't, like, resolve your transphobia, homophobia and stuff. Like, take your money back and just do better. As a queer event organiser yourself... Oh, yeah. How would you, do you think it's important to make events accessible to newer divergent people? Um. So, I decided to start doing um, events organising from where I um, I was unemployed and I was um, volunteering for an uh, art studio, uh, Airplay Studios. Please do check them out because uh, they need lots of help as they well. Help. They are awesome and it is community done, so like the more help the better. Um, but from doing like that, I saw that there was just gap um, in a lot of events. Um, and again, very gatekeepery. The um, I find in the queer community there is like three tiers of sort of people. Like you've got the young cool kids, um, which seems to be very clicky. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, then you've got your older queers, which I find are sort of living in the shadows and doing their own thing. Nearly, it's like we've been queer for however many years. Um, um, and then you've got the middle people, like me in my 30s, and I'm like, where the heck do I belong? Um, so I thought, well, why not create something? Um, so I created um, Air Events, which we do like. Um, it, I created it, and then my partner now helps, and we're basically doing both of it. Um, so we do like events, which have got like transparent um policies so if anything goes on everyone knows about it and it's like welcoming to everybody and it's constantly evolving we're trying to basically make it accessible to everyone and i really do make a thing about it being accessible because it's massively important um because i know how bad some places are i guess and yeah how do you make them accessible for somebody who might have a meltdown for example well, first you need to ask. Like, um, I I only know myself um, from personal experience of having meltdowns and sensory issues. Um, also, I really don't like alcohol places. I don't like drunk people. They scare me. Um, so I decided to do sober spaces um, to make it a bit more accessible in that. Um, my partner's disabled and I've learned a lot from them. Like what is accessible to them so no stairs um and if it does have stairs please have a lift um but yeah it's it's very hard but what i did uh, when i first started up air events was i put a lot of questionnaires out there uh, basically what is accessible to you and then basically i tried to commit to making every single point that someone would send in to me i know it's not going to be completely uh, 100% accessible. Um, it's very, very difficult, but I'm at damn sure that I make every single effort to do it. And I've got all record of doing everything and all that. So if you don't tell me, I can't do it, um, which we need to start speaking up, basically. Um, unfortunately, we can't do anything if people don't say they need something. And um, that's what I rely on with the events is I really do want people to speak up and say what they want and then I can do stuff. Okay, I've got one last question for you. Uh-oh. You no. are a queer, autistic, non-binary lesbian. You're obviously engaged to a queer, autistic, non-binary lesbian. I had to put that one in. So what is the best part about being engaged to me? Um, no comment. <laughs> I'm also an artist, um, apparently. Um, I draw gay things. Um, and that's interesting to my autism. Um, someone asked me how I come up with these ideas and 
I don't know. <laughs> Basically. Um, um, but if you like gay fruit and stuff, um, I am the hungry MB. I spelt it wrong on Animal Crossing, uh, but it is hungry. Not hungry. Hungry. Um, and that's on Instagram and stuff. Um, so you can see that. Um, do I need to say anything else? You didn't say what's so good about being engaged to me. I said no comment. Aww. I don't want this to be used in a court of law. Because um, I don't like police and I don't like the court system. <sighs> they are pretty good though. Um, I like the family. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, have a good pride. Um, try not to... Um, panic too much i guess try not to catch covid yeah we had it it wasn't fun uh, we had it in march um wear a mask like yes people are exempt and stuff but like try it in your house um a lot of it is anxiety um i had a full meltdown wearing one the first time wear it in your house try to protect everyone uh keep safe Leeds LGBTQ Health Inclusion Project, what we learned. The Leeds LGBTQ Plus Health Inclusion Project was a year-long project run by Advanet, Yorkshire Mesmac and Change. It was officially launched at an event in June 2019 and was funded by a grant from the Government Equalities Office. Its primary aim was to involve LGBTQ plus adults who are also either autistic, have a learning disability, or have mental health difficulties in the health services they use. Most of the staff working on the project were LGBTQ plus themselves. Some were also autistic, had mental health difficulties, or a learning disability. Throughout its run, the project delivered peer support sessions, self-advocacy training sessions and resources, awareness training for health and social care professionals, and an increase in the inclusion of people projects supported in the LGBTQ plus community. Throughout the year, a lot was learned and achieved as a result of the project's work. The project did a survey of health and social care professionals in the Leeds area. It's asked them whether they had received any training on LGBTQ plus health inequalities. 70% of respondents said they had not. To help address that, they held a one-day training course on that subject. It was attended by 41 people and delivered by LGBTQ plus people, some of whom were also neurodivergent. Afterwards, they asked them for their thoughts on the training. 94% of participants said they were either quite satisfied or very satisfied. 95% of them indicated that they intended to change at least some of their practice because of the training. Self-advocacy was a big part of the project. In a nutshell, it means speaking up for yourself and your rights. For this project, they worked on resources and training sessions to help LGBTQ plus people to advocate for themselves when using health services. They held a full course as well as taster sessions with Live Well Leeds LGBTQ plus group. More than 20 people took part over the project's duration, with feedback being positive. 91% of people said that it met or exceeded their expectations. Among the things learned by people taking part in the self-advocacy sessions were a greater understanding of how to put forward their own needs more confidently, better understanding of their rights, Communication and assertiveness skills to help them when accessing health services in future. Self-advocacy is important for getting your rights met. This was evidence in the work done by this project. Most people who attended said they were able to use their new skills to good effect. The peer support group was another key part of the project. As many of the staff and volunteers involved were LGBTQ plus and or autistic, had a learning disability or mental health difficulties, the peer support sessions held were peer led. In total, there were six sessions and a one-off workshop about group work. 
It's aimed to promote conversations about lived experience, sharing thoughts and feeling and taking ownership of them. Among those who came, feedback was positive. Participants said they felt more confident, enjoying the sessions and feeling relaxed and at ease. Among the skills shared during the session were using mindfulness practices and other means of managing anxiety. The confidence gained by participants had helped them to speak up more when accessing health services and putting forward their needs. Peer support is useful for helping people to know that they are not alone. In the LGBTQ+, autistic, learning disability and mental health communities, this is particularly true. By working with staff with experiences like their own, attendees came away feeling as though they were understood. Faye. Queerness, neurodiversity, and not having children. When I was about 10 or 11, someone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I answered that I wanted to be a mum. He asked if I didn't want a job as well, and I said I wouldn't mind so much being a teacher or maybe a lawyer, uh, but I would be rather busy as I was planning on having eight children. He assumed I was joking and replied that I should start soon if I was planning on having that many and I assured him that it was okay there's plenty of time because I was planning on having at least a few sets of twins. Uh, for some reason I had it in my head that twins ran in my family despite the fact that there are no twins in my family runners or otherwise. I was in general a bit of an odd kid and most people accepted that I was autistic I was epileptic and I was a bit of a daydreamer to say the least so it could be forgiven by adults at least kids are rarely that kind so it didn't really occur to this man to question why I felt my ultimate destiny was to be a mother despite the fact that I was child of two feminist parents who while being very comfortable in their cis-hetness thought that gender roles meant who remembered to pick up bread in the supermarket. Uh, they're not from Leeds, there was none of this bread cake, balm, bat, cob fuckery, thankfully. I still want kids. I am firmly set on fostering, maybe adopting eventually, but I'm not so set on that. See, I came out as a lesbian when I met one of those fabled creatures, a nice man and discovered that even though I wanted to want to have sex with him, I didn't want to have sex with him. For the first time I realised that my problems with relationships with men wasn't because I was awkward, it wasn't because of my autism, it wasn't because of my PTSD, it wasn't because of my bad health, it wasn't even because men generally are shit. It was because I was a big, old, raging homo. But I didn't really begin to journey towards queerness, that wonderful melting pot of sexuality and gender that lies beyond the millions of labels that we love to use and people still choose to use for all sorts of reasons, until one day when a kind family doctor was explaining to me that between my neurological conditions, my very hypermobile hips and my spinal degeneration, I should not ever even consider getting pregnant. Now, I'd already adjusted my image of Mother Faye to have a wife, not a husband, and to have two or three kids rather than eight because my maths had improved as I got older. But now that image didn't include me being the one with the big pregnant belly, me being the one going to get the scans and smiling at midwives, and me being the one being approached by strangers with congratulations or joining internet forums and being terrified that they'll let those crazy people have children. It took me a long time to get over that grief. But for me, part of that grieving process was doing a lot of thinking. Now there is so much discourse around on the news, on the internet, on Facebook, about motherhood and womanhood. There are whole factions of the internet who think that periods and babies are the only things that make a woman real. Now I haven't had a proper period for over a decade, thank the Norse gods. As I learnt more about the discussion around trans women and trans men, I knew for sure that I didn't believe a person had to have a vagina to bleed and give birth through to be a woman. That concept is ridiculous. Surely feminists like my mother 
has spent decades trying not to have women reduced to walking incubators. But being my overthinking, knowledge thirsty, autistic self, I carried on thinking. If a woman didn't need to have a vagina to be a woman, why was it decided that I was a woman because I did have a vagina? When in my life had I ever said I was a woman with any kind of feeling? When had I decided that was what I was? Was it even me who had decided that? The more I thought about it, and the more I met queer people, and most importantly, queer neurodivergent people, the less the rigid ideas of gender and sexuality and labels and identities I had absorbed from the world seemed to make sense. I found myself using the word lesbian less and less and just saying queer. I found myself questioning why people assumed I was a woman just because I love makeup and have two boulders stuck down my shirt, which trust me, I'd rather not have most days. And the more time I spent in queer circles, the more I noticed as well that neurodivergent people are largely overrepresented in our community. In fact, it turned out a lot of the friends that I had before I knew I was queer or before I really became comfortable being neurodivergent were also queer and neurodivergent and they didn't know back then either. Now, I'm a linguist, not a scientist, so I can't tell you if it's genetic, if it's because being neurodivergent makes you less likely to be conned by gender norms, if it's because queer people's quirks end up being diagnosed and over medicalized more than cishet people because people still view queer people as being a bit weird. What I can tell you is that I would not be the person I am today were it not for meeting a range of wonderful queers with autism, with ADHD, with PTSD, with BPD, with bipolar and many, many other forms of neurodivergence that we don't talk enough about. They're the people who made me comfortable being a non-binary queer person. And also they're probably the reason I met my beautiful neurodivergent queer fiance. So if you are a queer person and if you are neurodivergent, pride should be about two things for you. Pride of who you are as a queer person and pride of who you are as a neurodivergent person, because those two things cannot be separated. Here are some useful links to local services. Thank you for watching our video.